with a gummy leg? You needn't eat the leg, Johnson. The moment that I step outside So many reasons for me to run and hide Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. Here with me is Mr. Rish Outfield. Say hello to the folks at home, Rish. Hey guys, or gals, more importantly. (laughs) That's right. We're here just after International Women's Day to talk about Captain Marvel or Captain Marvel. That's how my mom refers to her because like she had relatives whose last names was Marvel. And I think, yeah, I think when Marvel Studios first started, she's like, oh, is this another one of those Marvel movies? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, but it is Marvel. Okay. Well, awesome. That's, n- I've never heard of anybody who mispronounced the word Marvel before. I mean, Marvel, sorry. <laughs> now we've met two people. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, we both went and saw it. It's it's just after opening weekend. Uh, Captain Marvel has has had its big day. How where do you want to start? How how well did this movie do? It did pretty good, right? One hundred and forty. I want to say one hundred and fifty three million opening weekend. Okay, that sounds great. How was? Do you know what that where that fits in the well, realm of the other movies that have come out recently, like Black Panther and Infinity War and stuff? Well, it didn't open as big as Black Panther, obviously, and it didn't open as big as The Avengers, but it had a bigger opening than Wonder Woman, which came out in the summer. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Probably outdid Ant-Man and the Wasp, I'm guessing, too, right? Ant-Man and the Wasp opened with 75. Oh, okay. So that's it's much better so than that. So this is considerably... In fact, I'm not a math guy, but I'd say it's almost twice what Ant-Man and the Wasp opening weekend was. Yeah, or you could also, I'm, I'm not a math guy either, but Ant-Man and the Wasp did all, almost half of what Captain Marvel did. <laughs> so Rogue One had a $155 million opening weekend, and this had uh, 153 so okay, Rogue very, One, very close. Yeah, it made a billion in the end. So well, sure. I guess we'll see if this has the staying power of Rogue One and can continue to make all that money. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a well received or at least a well uh, a lot of people interested in seeing it. They were there the opening day. I guess we could start from the start. <laughs> I really want to mention the Marvel logo that they started the movie with. I was unaware that this was going to happen, but they yeah, I was too. replaced all the normal pictures of, you know, Captain America throwing his shield and... Uh, Captain America throwing his shield and Scarlet Witch, like, shooting some kind of red stuff on the side are the two that I remember the most from that. I don't know why. Yeah, and, and then there was Stilt Man, you know, kicking his stilts up and Paste Pot Pete just wiping paste on somebody, I guess. And they took all of those out and uh, replaced them all with Stan Lee cameo shots of him doing his thing. You know, he's dressed in the old military uniform. Which one was that one from? That one's the one I noticed the most. Was that that's Captain, Captain America? America? Okay. Where he goes, I thought he'd be taller. <laughs> they had all of those in there. And it was, it, I don't know why, but yeah, I saw that and it made me want to cry. It was so cool. And then after, you know, the song went away and then it faded out and then the words came up that just said, thank you, Stan, if I remember right. Is that what it said? Wasn't that great? It just said, thank you, Stan. It was very understated. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, wasn't that nice? Yes, it was. To do that. And and I, I think enough time has passed that I don't feel sad that Stan is gone as much as, you know, I mean, I don't mourn his loss because... He lived such a, a long life and such a great life and everybody's tributes. But now it's just, it warms my heart <laughs> when people bring him up or when people remember him fondly. Yeah, and it was such a surprise to me when they did it too because it's been long enough. I guess this is the first movie probably that's come out since he's been gone, right? Right. 
The first Marvel Studios film? First Marvel Studios film, uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse came out post Stan Lee. Okay. But yeah, it's been long enough that they've stopped doing all the various things that they do, you know? Like Marvel Comics is for a long time were running, you know, every book that they put out just had a black page and it was, you know, there in in memory of Stan and you know, the people did all sorts of stuff. But it's been so long that yeah, it's it just it was yeah, that surprising because it we forgot Stan Lee, but you forgot that uh, that happened recently i guess relatively but yeah that was really sweet there was something just really nice about it and i was glad to see it now tell me this before we get much further how much do you know i mean you're you're a super marvel comics kind of a dude but i know that spider-man is your number one guy and if you were to ask you know spider-man questions you'd probably know the answer but what about Captain Marvel and his backstory, his slash her backstory, because he eventually changes persons, and all of this Kree, Skrull, War? Do you know a lot about this stuff? I, I know very little about this stuff. Captain Marvel, the original character, was dead before I ever started reading comics. In fact, the character that was Captain Marvel when I was reading comics, is the little girl that's the daughter of... Yeah, Monica Rambeau. Yeah, she was Captain Marvel in the 80s when I was reading books. I did know Carol Danvers by association. Like, Rogue was this super overpowered X-Men character, and I knew that it was because she had stolen the powers of Carol Danvers, and that's why she could fly and she could lift, uh, you know, a bus over her head and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. She had her mutant ability, which was to steal the powers of anybody she touched, but then she had permanently absorbed Carol Danvers' Ms. Marvel's powers, which made her doubly powerful. But I, yeah, I just, I, there, there was maybe one comic with Carol Danvers in it that I read growing up, uh, and she was a peripheral character. She was like an Avengers-adjacent character, and I wasn't an Avengers guy. The Kree-Skrull War I was vaguely aware of just because it was something that had happened in the 70s in Marvel Comics that, uh, you know, was a big event that people still remembered. But yeah, for the most part, I felt like... So on occasion, there would be a, a little box, a little star that says, remember from back in this issue... (laughs) Yeah, that was something that comics did in case your interest was piqued, in case your curiosity sparked and you're like, gosh, I'd like to find out who this person is. It was the the ancient version of a hyperlink. Yes. (laughs) But mostly I came to this movie not really knowing much. And I feel like that's usually a really good way to go into the movies because inevitably something gets changed. Uh, and not always for the better. And you can just avoid the, uh, oh, shoot, really? That's why they did that? Or they combined this character with this character? Or they turned so-and-so evil? That's something that, that you know, you don't have to deal with if you don't know. Yeah. But uh, how about you? You tell me what you knew. Uh, well, I mean... you you don't have a Captain Marvel action figure, do you? I do. I have a Captain Marvel. Oh, okay. Not a Marvel, though. <laughs> I have just Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel action figure that came out, what, like three or four years ago? Five years ago? Something like that? Yeah, to 2015. And I, I like Carol Danvers. I wasn't like you. I didn't read a lot of comics growing up. I had a, a short stint. You had sex in, in... I did, yes. I was having sex in high school. But yeah, I, I got into comics more in the 2000s. When you started telling me about all these comics and I started trying to read them, I was kind of getting into them because of the X-Men movies. And I started checking them out from the library and things like that and reading books. But I didn't know what was what. And it wasn't until when you started working with me and you would tell me, oh, yeah, and this is going on. And so I heard, I heard all about like Civil War, for example, through you. You know, you told me the whole story and then I went and 
read what was the actual story afterwards and discovered you were so wrong. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've I've learned of Carol Danvers from that. And I, I liked her a lot as Ms. Marvel. But I stopped with that stuff before she ever became Captain Marvel. So I don't know any of the Captain Marvel stuff. But I am aware... Like, my kids have watched a lot of the Avengers cartoons, and they did the secret invasion in the cartoons, which seemed like that. Oh, they did? Yes, they did. Interesting. I want to say one of your favorite episodes was where it was after the secret invasion happened, and Spider-Man winds up stuck in a subway with Captain America and a bunch of like innocent people and they're being stalked by like the serpent society and captain america has been impersonated by a scroll and said a bunch of bad things on national television you know tried to convince people to submit to their new alien overlords i for one (laughs) and so everybody's really angry at captain america and they all hate him and none of them believe that it wasn't really him that said it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I know where this is going. And so everybody's really angry with Captain America, but, you know, he just, he deals with it. He's just that guy, you know, he's just like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to keep doing what's right, and eventually they'll figure it out. And Spider-Man's just like, hey, can I be your sidekick? Because <laughs> he gets to spend this time with Captain America, and he's just so amazed at how cool he is. But anyways, they, so they did that, the, the secret war and that. So that's what it seems like we're in for at the start of this movie. Because we have scrolls and they are shifting their shape and doing things. And the whole big chase scene that I guess it's not the f- first act, but it, it maybe just after the act changed to, to act two. And we have a really big chase scene where... Captain Marvel punches an old lady in the face that was on the trailer. But yeah, I mean, that's... I know of the kree Scroll War kind of by way of that. I've seen Kree on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and in some other places. I, I mean, obviously we've seen them in Guardians of the Galaxy a little bit. Ronan the Accuser comes back for a prequel appearance. But yeah, I'm, I don't know the lore of Captain Marvel. I do know that Marvel was the name of the original Captain Marvel, but I, I don't really know anything about him or even what his powers are. So yeah, I was pretty fresh coming into this. Did you feel confused a little bit like I did at the start where we're just on this alien planet and she's there, and she's got, like, her team, and, and she's training, and she's going to see the Supreme Intelligence, and etc. Okay, I don't know what any of this stuff is. Should I care about it? <laughs> Do I need to really be straining? It's funny because I started out, We I went and saw this with my 15-year-old daughter, my 7-year-old son, and my wife. And the kids were sitting in the middle of us. And when I first when we first sat down... My seven-year-old son was next to me, and he just watched the movie. But then he had to pee, and so he got up and he went out, and I had my wife take him. While he was gone, my daughter's like, oh, I'm going to switch. So she switched so she could sit next to me, and then she kept asking me questions. (laughs) She wouldn't shut up with the questions, and I was just like, I don't know either. Stop asking me questions. (laughs) And the funny thing was my son was sitting next to my wife, and he kept going, oh! Oh, that's the Tesseract. The seven-year-old said this? Yeah, he was getting all excited every time he saw something that had to do with another movie that he'd seen. Mm. He would be like, oh, that's this from this movie. And my wife didn't know any of them. And I guess over the last week or so, my son has made her watch all the Marvel movies that are on Netflix. So she just finally watched Infinity War like yesterday. She hadn't seen it at all. And... She was saying that my seven-year-old son made her sit there until the credits were done so that he could see the scene with the pager so he would know what that was. (laughs) Yeah, did you feel that way at all? Were you confused or were you just happy to be along for the ride? Yeah, that's, that's how I felt. Because it flashed back to 
some kind of accident and the blue blood coming out of her nose, I figured, okay, eventually we'll flash back to what that was and, and how this happened and the mystery of who she was or whatever was was compelling enough that I was like, okay, yeah, I know there are flashbacks because I'd seen the trailer and it showed her as like a fighter pilot and stuff. And so, and a five-year-old. Yeah, that's true. They did show her as the little kid in the trailer too, but th they didn't have to tell the story that way. I'm not really sure that the amnesia was necessary, but I felt like they just wanted there to be some kind of mystery. So we're learning who she is at the same time as she is. That's fine. I Spoilers, obviously. I mean, every time we do one of these, we're going to spoil the crap out of these movies. But it, I wonder if we're legally obligated to say spoiler at some point. <laughs> we usually do. We usually do. I don't good. think we've spoiled too much yet. But we will. And uh, this was a period film, sort of, um, <laughs> when she crashes down. And that doesn't happen for a while, actually. You get a lot out on the the Cree homeworld. I can't remember what that was called. Do you? Holla. Okay. Can I get a whoop whoop? <laughs> hey, it was a period piece, so of course uh, that's what they're using. But yeah, that's what it's called, Holla. H-A-L-A. -A. Uh, Sorry. Okay, so it, it takes, takes place on that world, the unnamed Cree world, and and she's training with Jude Law's character, whose name is Yon Rog. Jeez, oh, now I know how I must have looked on the playground talking about Bosk and IG eighty eight <laughs> and stuff. And he's sort of her mentor. He's like the the head of her squad in the Star Force. And before I saw the movie, I had seen like a, a shot of a bunch of guys in the Star Force uniforms, which are like, you know, green Space Corps uniforms or whatever. And it just seems to me like Marvel's Green Lantern Corps. <laughs> and I totally can get behind that. I just really always liked the idea of the Green Lantern Corps much more than the idea of Green Lantern. You know what I mean? Of uh -huh. just like a bunch of superheroes from different worlds that are on a team together. I just thought that that was very neat. And essentially we sort of get that at the beginning with like a mission that they're sent on and Yon rog you know, sparring with her, trying to make her a better soldier and filling in, her, you know, character details and that. And, and he's always able to best her in the fight. And yeah, then there's this mission that goes terribly wrong against the Skrull and, uh, Carol Danvers, and her name's not Carol Danvers. What is her name? Veers? Yeah, she's called Veers at that point. So this character of Veers is captured by the Skrull, and they probe her mind, and I think they uncover these memories, these blocked memories of her life before that she's not really able to remember, only flashes of. And we get this guy with a really funny accent talking. And... <laughs> She comes to, and she's on this Skrull warship, let's say, and using her abilities. And yeah, that they never explained why she had different powers from all the people around her. You know what I mean? And I didn't understand why she had pink skin when the Kree have blue skin. But Yonrog had pink skin, so I was just like, okay, well, yeah. I don't know why this is this way. Because, like, Yondu and all of them on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Ronan the Accuser all had blue skin. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is I remember Wreck-It Ralph. What, what was, what's the guy's actual name? John C. Riley. John C. Riley was on Guardians of the Galaxy as a guy on what was their planet uh uh zanzibar is it really like that. called that okay we'll just say no it's not zanzibar but it's something really similar okay well, zandar is on zan doesn't matter he was in the nova core on i was gonna say planet nova because of nova core but that's not it so he was there and he was like the guy in the nova core and then at the end of the movie when everybody's safe and the Guardian saved him, he gets to go home to his family and he's married to like a blue-skinned woman and he has like blue children. 
I think they were blue, weren't they? Or were they green? Maybe they were green. Yes, I think they were blue. We'll just say they were people of color. <laughs> Maybe they were purple and we're completely yeah. confusing races here. But see, you have always been colorblind. I he was red and she was blue and the kids are purple. Yeah, so I just got the feeling that, you know, the Kree Empire includes a bunch of places and some are humanoid. I mean, they're all humanoid, but some are pink skins. Others are blue skins. Okay. And they had, what's his face? Uh, Korath. Korath, that's it. Who, just a regular old black guy, he didn't have different colored skin. But we remember him from Guardians of the Galaxy as well. He's the guy that's there when Star-Lord finds the little thing and he says, Who? Who? He says, Star-Lord, come on, you have to, who? <laughs> he's that guy. And he's part of their team. I'm glad that you recognize him. He's on Captain him. Marvel's team. I've always liked Jaiman Hansu, and uh, and it was just neat to see him as a good guy in this. Yeah, before he became... Uh, I can't remember that it's been so long. Was he working for Ronan? I don't remember. I think he, I, ultimately, yes. But I think he was a mercenary kind of thing, trying to get the, the sphere, the thing that Star-Lord gets at the very right. beginning of the movie... You know, that's the MacGuffin that everybody is after through that whole movie. And uh, it turns out to be an Infinity Stone, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we see Korath. I thought that was neat. You see a blue guy with a white beard, which just looks so strange. But, you know, I just need to be <laughs> less racist. I, my therapist is always telling me that. Yeah, you really should. A yeah, blue person can be Santa Claus, too. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And, and he, he puts me through this exercise where I have to just say panther instead of black panther. And I, it's helped me, I believe. <laughs> Anyhow, she escapes from the Skrull and takes off in their escape pod and crashes down on Earth through the roof of a blockbuster video, putting the movie clearly in the minds of everyone but your son that this is the 1990s and uh, you do get a, a little bit of fun at the expense of the 1990s throughout this film the whole rest of the movie takes place on earth and uh, you know shield is called in because she's wrecked the the blockbuster video and yes what shield agent happens to be there but nick fury and We've talked about this thing, you know, we we talked about the horror show that was de-aged Carrie Fisher. We've talked about, you know, the uncanny valley that was Grand Moff Tarkin and stuff like that. But the youngish Samuel L. Jackson in this movie was flawless. I stared at it for an hour waiting for something weird, for it to look weird. And it never, ever did to the point where I thought, Maybe this isn't di digital de-aging. Maybe they just put a wig on him and he's got a very youthful face. Kind of like they did with Kurt Russell in Guardians 2, where they just put a wig on him and shaved his beard. And everybody's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's like 25-year-old Kurt Russell. <laughs> but apparently he was digitally de-aged. I could never have told you that. It did not look like a special effect to me. Uh, we do see Agent Coulson a couple of times and... I don't know why that never looked right, but uh, it didn't. Yeah, he didn't look as good as, as Samuel Jackson. I was gonna, I was gonna mention that his looked a little more obvious. But why is that? Because Nick Fury's look has changed a hundred and eighty degrees. You know, with no hair and the eye patch and facial hair, and maybe that's all it takes. Is you put hair on him, you shave his beard, and you give him two eyes, and suddenly he looks. 35 or however old he was supposed to be in that movie whereas colson what, what what did they do to clark gregg would you say i think basically all they did was scrub his wrinkles off a little bit i mean his face just looked a little a little too clean it just didn't look quite right and that was i think the only real difference between him and i don't think they changed his hairline or anything but it didn't look right why? I don't know. I couldn't say. Because it can't be that we're used to Clark Gregg, you know, being 50 or however old he really is. It just, it, it didn't look convincing. 
And it may all also just be they spent, you know, twelve million dollars on Samuel Jackson de aging, and they spent seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on Colson de aging, and that's where yeah, it could be. the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, they just got on with Photoshop real quick and did the smudge tool for a second. They're like, yeah, we'll say that's good enough. <laughs> the smudge tool. Uh, anyhow, so Nick Fury and Veers, because she's never Carol Danvers until the very end of the movie, and she's never Captain Marvel. Ever. So, uh, yeah, that I, I kind of wonder, well, where does that name come from? Who gives her that name? Why is this movie called that? But anyhow, uh, those two sort of team up eventually as she's trying to convince him that there are a group of shape-shifting aliens on the Earth that are after her. And more importantly, they're after a faster-than-light engine that was made by her mentor, who Annette Bening plays, who I believe is Marvell. Yeah, it eventually comes out that she is Marvell, although for the first, I don't know, hour or so of the movie, we just think that she must be some Earthling that has a regular... I don't remember what her name was. Let's just say it was Wendy Lawson, and we'll move on. Okay, I guess I can go with Wendy Lawson. Anyhow, those two sort of team up. Once Nick Fury becomes aware that there really are alien shapeshifters, the two of them forge kind of a a tenuous alliance. And I think that alliance eventually becomes a friendship. They go investigate together what, you know, Dr. Lawson's craft was. And, And it turns out that she was once Carol Danvers, who was a fighter pilot, and she was, she was a test pilot and flew this experimental ship that Wendy Lawson built that turned out to be a faster-than-light ship and crashed. And she was recovered by the Kree, who uh, sort of brainwashed her into becoming one of them. And, and I feel like I've skipped like a whole hour of the movie but the punchline is these creepy reptilian shape-shifting scrolls with green skin turn out not really to be bad guys, but the people that she has spent the last six years around, the Kree, are bad guys. And I found that to be kind of a neat twist that I didn't see coming. And, and the way that they pulled the rug out from under us is, A, they're reptilian, they're green-skinned, And we always associate that with villains because it's race memory from when we were always fleeing from dinosaurs as cavemen. (laughs) That's a joke. But the other really smart trick is that they cast Ben Mendelsohn as Talos, the leader of these Skrulls, because you only cast Ben Mendelsohn as a bad guy. Uh Only. In fact, it's the law. If you click on his... Wikipedia page, it's right there, the third paragraph. I guess Australia has funny rules, but it is the law that you only cast him as a bad guy. And so I was really surprised when he turned out to be all right. Yeah, I don't, I mean, like I, we talked about the Cree Scroll War and what we knew of it and stuff. And I kept waiting. I wasn't surprised to find out that the Cree were bad guys because they've been bad guys in a bunch of different things that I've seen. I wasn't too surprised when that turned out to be the case. I mean, it was a good twist because I did believe that the Skrull were bad guys because I've seen them as bad guys. I know that they're bad. You know, the Cree Skrull War, from what I understand of it, is there's a Cree Empire and there's a Skrull Empire, and we're kind of just territory in between that just happens to be battleground territory you know they're just like yeah we want this planet no we want it too and so they fight over it and they're both bad guys you know what i mean and sure it doesn't matter you know which one you're fighting against they're both a problem and so what i was expecting to happen was for the scroll to turn out to not be good guys either you know what I mean? Oh, and you were expecting it a turns out triple that, cross. Right. Well, not, I mean, yeah, I guess you could call it that. But I was just waiting. You know, he convinced her that 
they were the bad guys, which, you know, somebody from his side would, because in his mind, they are the bad guys and he's the good guys. You know, he's, you know, he's on the one side. And so, of course, his side is the good side and the other side is the bad side. And then she's on the other side. So she thinks he's the bad side. I mean, they're all just people, you know what I mean? So whoever's aggressing, I guess, are, are worse. But, you know, they're all just people in the end. It's the way wars are. Most of the people there are just doing what they're told by their government. No, that's where the bad guys are. But, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I was just waiting for that next revelation where she's now helping them against this guy and she... You know, they they still have the problem with Yonrog, but then it turns out that also Talos is a bad guy as well. And, you know, in the end, she's like in between the two of them as they fight her. Something like that was what I was expecting. But when they get on to the ship and all his family comes out and we find out that he's actually just trying to rescue them and he doesn't care about the Tesseract at all, then I'm just like, okay, I guess that's not coming after all. But then it makes me wonder, what does that bode for the future? Well, yeah. Can you go back on this now and make scrolls back into villains? Well, yeah, let's let's talk about the ending of the movie. So eventually, Carol discovers that she is an incredibly okay. L- let me come up with a more negative word. Um, okay. Eventually, Carol discovers that she is a ludicrously powerful being. And that she, the, the Kree had been dampening her powers, keeping her, keeping her down. And once she is unfettered and becomes the... the Goes binary? Yeah, I, I've heard people say that. I don't know what that means. I don't either, but I've heard that's what it's called. I think she, uh, my daughter, who's really into uh, anime stuff, said that she became a super saiyan, oh, okay. I think it is. Your daughter needs to be grounded. It's what they do on Dragon Ball Z, I guess. She needs to be grounded and reminded she's not too old to be spanked. <laughs> okay, if she goes binary, as you said. She takes down like a, f- a whole Kree warship and scares off the other ships and... Then she's going to go stop the Kree Skrull War out in space. And there was a line in the trailer. It sounded like she was talking to them of, you know, I'm here to stop your war. She says, I'm not going to fight your war. I'm going to end it. Oh, okay. Well, yes. I forget I'm dealing with somebody with an eidetic memory. (laughs) Yes, there, there was that line in the trailer. And that doesn't happen in the movie. She blasts off to end this and and oh and there's a scene where she confronts ronan the accuser and ronan retreats but he says oh we're going to come back for the weapon and we assume that she he's talking about the the mcguffin tesseract Tesseract, uh which is 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 a point of contention in this movie but it's not it's her she is the weapon but the movie ends and none of that is resolved the movie actually ends and it's 25 years later and it's Avengers Endgame and Carol Danvers has gotten the page from Nick Fury and has come to save the day. But I felt like her story is not done. Her There's more to tell. Can you do a Captain Marvel 2 that ignores the, the time travel element the 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 2019 element and just continues from 1996 97 and finishes this this Kree scroll war storyline i don't know i mean you could will it work will people want to see it i don't know well when when captain america came out in 2011 i was really disappointed that all of world war ii was left behind in that movie. That is like, there was nothing else significant that happened with Captain America, which means that he didn't team up with Namor and the Human Torch and, you know, and they didn't have adventures as the invaders. I was just sad because it's like, oh, I love World War II and that would have been so interesting. But no, it was all tied up in a little bow and now it's 2011 and he is awakened. They told all of that time within the space of a little montage yeah, it's like we never need make this a period film again. We're so sorry, folks, 
that we ever felt the need to do it. Oh, but with this one, I just, I just felt like, well, but there's more story to be told. Can we do Avengers movies that take place in the present and Captain Marvel movies that take place in the past? Or am I giving the audience too much credit? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That That is trouble. Will people be confused? Will they understand? Do you have to do a previously on Captain Marvel and then show what happened? <laughs> but I, I guess the DC train wreck movies start with Wonder Woman in 2000 and let's say 16. And then the next time we see her, it's in like the 19 teens. And then the next time we see her is 2017. And then the next time we see her, it's 1984. And I don't think that confuses anybody, right? Well, we haven't had the 1984 one yet. We'll have to see about that. Maybe that'll be the test. Yeah, but it's called Wonder Woman 84. I would think even your seven-year-old will be like, hey, this is 84. He'll be like, what happened to the other 82 movies between Wonder Woman 1 and Wonder Woman 84? Oh, that's clever. I didn't see any of those. Your son is actually pretty pretty <laughs> smart alecky for a seven-year-old. you, you got to watch him. <laughs> Definitely not too old to be spanked. Okay, I feel like I jumped over a big bunch of the movie. Is there Are there any sequences or any scenes or any parts or any characters that you would like to talk about? Not anything in particular, I don't think. Okay, well then I'll just talk about what I want to talk about. Okay. Just, uh, just lay there and think about England while I do this. Um, <laughs> I saw it with my cousin... And because the movie ostensibly, and I'm sorry to keep hacking on this, I've become a pedant, I guess. Uh, but because the movie ostensibly takes place in 1996, um, wait, is it 96, 95? It's six years after 1989. That would be. So it could be 1993. That's how good my math skills are. Because the movie takes place there, there's a ton of 90s nostalgia clinging to this movie like a gray patch on an orange oh i'm just a girl guess i'm some kind of freak because they all sit and stare with their eyes and my cousin was just like wow neat did you hear that no doubt song and wow neat did you hear that <laughs> nirvana song and wow neat what was the song that you sang that i'm only happy garbage garbage and i was like yeah it is garbage man good job and he's like no that's the name of the band and it's that times 20, what Guardians of the Galaxy was to kitschy late 70s music. This was to that mid 90s post grunge era thing. And, and, and I know that young people, that people have so much nostalgia for the 90s. But I mean, you, you knew me in the 90s. <laughs> the unhappiest I ever was in my life was in the 1990s. And so when I'm Just a Girl starts playing in an action sequence, I winced and I was like, oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Oh, am I making my shelf clear? I'm just a girl. And that didn't just happen one time. It happened again and again and again. And I guess I just have a problem with that because I had a problem with whenever Thor started spinning his hammer around in Ragnarok. They played that Led Zeppelin song that I hate. And I just, I was just like, can't it just be a score? Okay, guys. And so I, I guess I have a problem with that. Okay. But I wanted to talk to you about the 90s nostalgia in this movie. I think the real problem that I had, I mean, I also, I am not like you. I don't hate the 90s. I don't look back at them in an angry way. Oh, I, I never said I hated the 90s. I don't only remember the swirlies that I got in the 90s and nothing else. No, that's because you were the one holding me down. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I, don't have, I didn't have the same issues as you in the 90s, so I don't have the same problems with it. A lot of those songs, well, some of them I don't, I'm surprised to have heard them again like... The, it seemed like they didn't pick the best songs from the 90s. But the real problem was, I think, that they didn't have 
a good reason to include them. You know what I'm saying? Like, Guardians of the Galaxy really went out of their way to give you a really good reason why all these songs were in the movie. They had the whole thing. The mom made the mixtape, and it was the only thing that he had, and he played it all the time, and he listened to it, and he was willing to fight that prison guard over his Walkman. And this one just, oh yeah, it's it's 90s, so let's use this stuff. And it worked in some cases, because yeah, it was 90s, so it would, the music, I don't know, it would be playing in the bar or something like that. Yeah, they played Kiss Me Deadly. But the end when they, yeah, and that was good, because that's a good song. Agreed. They played You Gotta Be by Desiree and Waterfalls by TLC. And I just, yeah, I shudder and I can't stop shuddering. I need a, a heat blanket thrown on me. Yeah, and those and those weren't too bad. The worst example was when they're fighting in a spaceship in space and just a girl starts playing. It just didn't fit, you know? I mean, it's one thing, oh, they're driving down the road in the 90s and yeah, okay, they're going to hear waterfalls on the radio or whatever, sure. But... When just a girl was playing and she fights guys in a spaceship in space, then it, it just didn't, you, that's when you need the score instead of the song, it seems. It just didn't fit as well. And I don't hate that song. I actually really liked the song back in the day when it first came out. I, yeah, it hasn't held up as well as some other songs have, but... Oh, I've had it up to here. It's not one that stuck with me as, you know, I don't remember it as fondly as you remember Kickstart My Heart. Hey! But, uh... I told you that in confidence, dude. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know, it just didn't It just didn't work for some reason. I, maybe they needed more of a hook? Well, there, there was too much of it. There, it was all over, and like I said, yeah, they played some really bad songs, and, and, that, and bad is relative. But, I mean, there was just too much of it. There was a salt and pepper song, and they played an Elastica song. And I think that the lead singer of Elastica has forgotten about Elastica. And yet, <laughs> there, was, there it was. I think they, they played a whole song for the end credits. Not an entire song. Oh, yeah. But a song by the band Hole. And I wonder just how the feel of the movie would be different if it had been score. The person, I, I guess it's a man... Who, uh, no, it's a woman. The woman scored it. His name Pinar Toprak. And I was going to ask you, who is Pinar Toprak? What has she done? But come on. <laughs> I do not know. Uh, that's, that's a silly question. I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at her credits, she had an additional music credit on Justice League. And that's the only movie anyone has seen on her filmography. She is Turkish. No, it says Turkish American. What does that mean? Oh, uh, she was Turkish, but she moved to the United States. Is my guess. Okay. Oh, when I lived in LA, when this can be an outtake, it would drive my coworkers crazy when I would refer to Charlize Theron as African American, and so I would do it <laughs> all the time. Anyhow, I I just I don't remember the score. Maybe you've listened to it a bunch of times because you tend. To. I have not. If it's worth listening, I will go check it out. But I feel like if the score were a little stronger, maybe you pull out some of those pop songs and put in more score. Yeah, I, ha I haven't listened to the score. And I was going to mention that in the show because I sent you a video today that I found on YouTube where somebody took the fight scene in the helicarrier from the Avengers part one. And they went through and they took all the themes for each of the various characters that we see and they inserted them in and said, this is how cool the music and the movies could be if only they'd <laughs> done this. The helicarrier gets hit and it's, you know, the engine blows up and it's crashing and, you know, they're trying to avert disaster and, and all sorts of stuff is going on. And we see all of the various Avengers doing stuff. And what they did in this is they took the themes that had been established for the various Avengers in other films and they played them when you saw those people doing their big heroic thing or even, you know, a little snippet of it when they were just doing something. And it was so cool. Like, I watched that and it actually made me tear up 
when I heard these songs and I thought, oh my gosh, this could be so good. And these, it's funny because the, the themes that they've come up with for the various movies, they're not bad. You know, they're not super forgettable. They just don't stress them much. And if they just did, then we would remember them as much as we remember. I mean, after t- what, 20, this is 22? I'm going to say 21. Okay, after 21 movies hearing these themes over and over again, there's no way they wouldn't be. They'd be as recognizable as somebody humming the John Williams Superman theme or the Star Wars themes or Indiana Jones or Harry Potter or... Oh, come on, give me another John Williams. They're only John Williams that anybody remembers. Jaws. (laughs) Jaws. Jurassic Park. Okay, so anyways, you'd, you'd know it as well as all of those. If only they just used them. And it made me sad. And then I, after I saw that, I, and, and then I sent it to you and sheepishly confessed that I had been crying over this movie, I thought about Captain Marvel. And I thought, what was Captain Marvel's theme? Not a single thing, not a note came to mind. The only thing I could think of was, uh, I'm just a girl? <laughs> I can't do the little things I hold so dear Cause it's all those little things that I fear I don't know what her... Is it just a song? I mean, uh, sometimes people would say the ACDC music is Iron Man's theme song more than actually the theme song that they wrote for him. Yeah. Shoot to Thrill or something like that. So... Maybe that could be it, but that didn't really seem like it either. Because yeah, it was it. It felt so shoehorned into the the movie that that didn't feel right either. So it was. There's nothing that I can think of from the music of it other than the pop songs from the '90s, which not all of them were really all that memorable. The ones that you really think, oh yeah, oh remember that song? Yeah, that was great. None of them. I I'm pretty sure that this soundtrack is not going to be tearing up the charts like the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack did. And I don't know why, but that just feels like a bummer. Every time I see a Marvel movie, I feel a little bummed that they aren't doing a better job. And it seemed like we went and saw Infinity War, and Infinity War, at the very least, they played the Avengers theme a few times in it. And you get a thrill. You shoot to thrill every time you hear it. (laughs) That's right. It's surprising It shouldn't be, but it is that they actually used it. Because, you know, they've made like three Thor movies. Each time they had a different composer who composed all new music, didn't use anything from the last guy. And so there is no real Thor theme song. And they did the same thing with Iron Man and they did the same thing with Captain America. They've done the same thing with most of their movies. But yeah, in, in Infinity War, you got both the Avengers theme song and you got to hear Black Panther's theme song when they went to Wakanda and it was cool when we got those two tiny little things that they gave us us soundtrack dorks <laughs> the bone they threw you to go ooh, 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 by playing two of the 30 themes that they could have it almost felt like hey maybe marvel realizes that they're blowing it and they're going to do a better job but then this movie came out and yeah no, it doesn't feel like it feels like it's exactly the same as all the rest so who knows maybe that'll improve but this movie wasn't it well yeah i I don't know other people must not feel the same way that you and i do or they would have corrected this problem but conversely other people must feel the same way you and i do or somebody wouldn't have spliced in superhero themes into the avengers I I guess it's something that resonates with you and with me and another portion of the uh, viewing public. But I don't think the score was bad. I just, it wasn't memorable. But had we had fewer pop songs and more of the score, maybe I would remember some of it. I don't know. I mean, like in in the credits, end credits, you even get the Courtney Love song instead of whatever Captain Marvel's theme should have been, which at least serves to cement it in the audience's mind as they wait for the post-credit sequence or mid-credit sequence i guess is how these things work but yeah hey there was one other thing i wanted to talk to you about and I, i wanted to lead with this at the very beginning but it's not necessary 
I just felt like I wanted to address the, uh, and it's not even an elephant in the room. It's more of a taper. You know what a taper is? It's one of those ugly, they're mammals. Someone who puts tape on things? They have like a sort of a, a mini trunk snout. Like a like a anteater? A little bit like that. Yeah, they're not a, a beautiful animal, but uh, it is in the room and I figured I would mention it. Um, I never tire of talking about the people, the contingent of Star Wars fans that will not stop about The, the Last Jedi. They will not shut up about it. And I, I've always asked the musical question, are there just millions of anti-Last Jedi fans out there? Or are there just a handful of them? But they're so loud that they make me think, well, there must be millions of these. Because everywhere I go, I hear one of these guys. Anyway, you know where I'm going with this. There was a very vocal portion of the population in the days leading up to Captain Marvel's release that said, this movie's anti-men, this movie is extremist feminist, this movie is not made for guys, Brie Larson doesn't want guys to go see this movie, she doesn't want guys to continue to live, we need to boycott this movie, a really good alternative is to see Alita Battle Angel, we need to stomp on this movie so that it fails the way that we succeeded in making Solo fail. You've heard some of these things, right? Mm-hmm. So in the back of my mind, a little voice said, gosh, what if they're right? What if there's some weight to what they are shouting? What if I go see this movie and it is like a kick to the nuts to every male that dared go see this movie? But, but at the same time, I was just like, but why would Marvel Studios do that? Right. Why would they alienate anybody? Why would they, but especially why would they alienate half of the potential audience and all that? So I, because it's Marvel Studios, I went as soon as the movie came out and I paid full price and I will continue to do that until, you know, they give me reason to question. It's like, I feel like they've earned my dollar. And so I went and dude, there was not, there was no militant feminism in this movie. And there was no F you to, to guys or to fill in the blank of any portion of the viewing audience. It was a totally universally entertaining movie and a, a resonant movie, no matter what color your skin was or what gender you were or identify with. I just, it, it made me a little disappointed in myself that I ever considered that those screamers might be right. And I just wondered if you, how you felt going into the movie and if there was a moment where you're like, oh, okay, you don't want me to see this. Yeah, I uh, made a point of avoiding that kind of stuff uh, as it was coming in. I didn't want to have anybody trying to color my uh, perception of it before I ever got to see it. So anytime anything like that would come up here or there or whatever, I would just n- not look at it. I didn't I didn't bother. And yeah, in the end it was it was fine. There was nothing uh you know, they had Brie Larson being a woman trying to make it in the air force or whatever and you know, a lot of her memories were her being told she was just a girl and little old me won't let me drive late at night or something like that. Did you just <laughs> quote the no doubts? What other lines from that song are there? Because <laughs> I'm just a girl, I'd rather not be. Because they won't let me drive late at night. Oh, I'm just a girl, take a good look at me. Just your typical prototype. You know, there was there was stuff like that. There's the guy who says, don't you know why they call it the cockpit? And then they play that line again for a second, but they cut before he actually says cockpit. So, you know, there was a little tiny things here and there. But, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't something that colored the movie much. It didn't make that much of a difference in the end. Uh, as to whether it was a good show or, a, you know, not a good show. I, I didn't find that to be 
an issue. Which is good, because I was hoping that it wouldn't be. I didn't want... That's the main reason why I avoided anything that anybody had to say about it, so that I didn't go in there with my dukes up or something like that, ready to be in a fight. Because I, 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 I want to not have to deal with that kind of stuff. I hate that kind of stuff. It drives me crazy. And yeah, I was, I was glad that it wasn't much of a thing in there. There wasn't a lot to it. I don't know. I mean, what did you think of the movie overall? Oh, I thought it was a lot of fun. What would be your thumbs up, thumbs down? Yeah, thumbs, <laughs> totally thumbs up. You know, I didn't think it was the best of the Marvel Studios films. And there were little things here and there that I didn't love. But overall, yeah, I, I thought the movie was really good. And I, I told my mom, hey, you, you would really enjoy Captain Marvel. But you'd have to call it Captain Marvel and not Marvel. <laughs> Good point. Yes, I should have given her that caveat. I hope she hasn't seen it yet so I can warn her in time. It's like they, <laughs> most of the time they said it right. And then one time Brie Larson said Marvel. I don't know why. And I was like, oh, gosh, you noticed that too, Ma? <laughs> Jeez. But what was the thing I was going to say? Oh, we talked about when we, you and you and I saw Wonder Woman about how, you know, empowering that movie might have been toward girls, you know, that look and see Diana as a, as a role model, as a hero, is that, you know, I want to be that, I want to be strong, and, you know, all the things that Wonder Woman is. And I felt like this film had that in spades, you know, and it, it's epitomized by, like, that montage of her getting up. She falls and she's getting up yeah. throughout different stages in her life. But, you know, not just for girls... But everybody can take something from that and be inspired by this character in the same way as you didn't have to have dark skin to thrill to Black Panther and say Wakanda forever and enjoy that movie. And the portion of the audience, you know, that, that said that it was going to be too political or, or fill in the blank, I should have just remembered how Black Panther was that it was universally entertaining and that Marvel is smarter than making a movie that would not resonate with everybody that goes to it. And I feel like, you know, too many people want to see the differences between you and me and that person over there and, oh, look at the her. Whereas, you know, there are a lot of things that we all have in common. There's a lot of things that we all respond to whether you're an old fart like me or your seven-year-old son or anybody in between or, or my mother who's in her 70s, I still think that there was something worth recommending to her in this movie too. And, I, and it would be really enjoyable to hear her take on it. And then, yes, of course, she's going to be like, well, I didn't understand the part at the end where there was all these characters from other Marvel movies I haven't watched that are talking about something I didn't get. And I was like, oh, Ma, you didn't get up and walk out as soon as the credits started rolling? Oh, and that's another crazy thing. This is the 21st Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. Nobody got up and walked out when the credits started playing. It's the first one I've ever seen where nobody got up. Uh, in fact, I think you and I mentioned it in Infinity War. It's like, people are really leaving? You don't want to know what <laughs> you're really leaving? People did complain in the theater I was at when they got to the very, very end and it was just the cat horking up the Tesseract. It was the last they uh, complained bit about that they'd that? stayed for. They're like, oh, we waited all that time just for that. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, Infinity War didn't have one. And Ant-Man's was worse than stupid. Really, they, they complained about this, which was at least amusing and sort of filled in a, a plot detail about the Tesseract. Yeah. No, I feel like I've, I've kept you up really, really late. I'm sorry. It's two o'clock in the morning for you. It's all right. It's spring break, so I don't have to get up with anybody in the morning. I can sleep late if I want. That's good. But yeah, I do want to say that I really enjoyed seeing Nick Fury in such a major role in this movie. And that he is just a lot of fun. Like all the scenes where they were together, buddy copping, you know, <laughs> it was just delightful. And it was neat to see Coulson in any aspect. I know he was 
the lead on a TV series for years, but it was still just neat to see him again. There was lots and lots of humor throughout the movie, and I, I, I responded to that, you know, the, the personalities of the Skrulls and, and, and that, were you know, like the Skrull scientist, like every time he had something to say, we, you would laugh. The movie was fun, and it was a good time, and I don't feel like it aspired to be this gargantuan, epic, life-changing movie in the same way that an Avengers does, or even Black Panther did. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe every movie they're hoping is a tentpole, gargantuan, blockbuster, life-changing event. But as far as a, like, you know, standalone Marvel origin film, I felt like this totally worked. Yeah, it was good. I'm, I'm kind of uh, in the same camp as you as far as my rating of it. It's, I gave it a thumbs up. It wasn't, like, the best that Marvel had to offer, but it wasn't the worst that they've uh, had to offer either. I have to admit that I never really connected all that much with Brie Larson's character. She seemed... I'm not sure what to say about it. She seemed really kind of angry a lot of the time. And then here and there she would toss out a joke. And when she did, it always seemed a little weird. Seemed out of character. To me, where you're like, is that a joke? Is she, should Fury laugh at that, or should he... I don't... Uh, I wanted to like her more than I did, and I'm not sure why I didn't, what it was about it that that she didn't... Uh, another thing that I thought was really weird was that... Uh, and you mentioned Ben Mendelsohn before being an Australian, and I guess he's just using his regular accent in this this movie... That seemed really weird to me. Yes, it did to me too. Um, I wonder if it's, it's his it real was, accent or if it's like a super cartoony exaggeration of... That's even what... Like, I could say that it felt even more like that. It felt to me like one of the chimney sweeps. It's just like really, really thick accent. and But it sounded very, very much like an earth accent if you know what i'm oh, saying good point it did not work as this guy's an alien well then why does he sound like he came right out of melbourne or whatever it, it doesn't sound like an alien in any way like the cree you know when ronan the accuser talked he didn't feel earth bound uh per se jude law seemed the same way and here and there, there were things that just didn't make sense to me. And I think it was all the alien guys talking. Uh, they would say stuff, words, and slang, things like that that they shouldn't know. Sure. They just didn't feel like aliens. You know what I mean? Like, they, they look no, like no, aliens. No, you're totally right. Early, early, early on when she is being mind scoured, let's say, uh, you hear all these voices before you see who they are. Mm -hmm. And they're so obviously earthers because of the way they're talking that when they're revealed to be aliens, I'm just wondering, well, is this being translated from, does she have a universal translator and it's being translated into colloquial English? I, I just feel like that <laughs> has to be a decision that they made of, Ben, how would you like Talos to talk? And he's like, well, I was thinking it might be really fun to give him this some kind of Bush accent. Like that. Although the voice I'm doing, I mean, that's cartoony, but that's not the voice that he did. Right. He did. It was strange. And I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if at some point in his past he had a teacher or a, an uncle or somebody who spoke like that, that he was channeling. It was like a very specific, but again, a very specific earth dialect whereas like lee pace as ronan is not speaking like lee pace he's doing like a faux like in the middle of english and american you know some theatrical way of speaking so that sounds unusual and it's great because he's an alien right and you know like uh like jaiman hansu is from africa and english is not his first language Gem gemma chan who is minerva is doing a different accent and all that stuff. It all those characters felt right. 
because it was all unusualness that was difficult to place. You know, where is that from? Oh, well, that an alien world. Yeah, and just the word choices that they use sometimes. When he said, like, he used the word kids, the alien does. Why would he use the word kids? It seems like he should be using the word children. I don't know. There's just a lot oh. of stuff like that that just seemed off. They didn't feel like aliens to me, which kept pulling me out of the film and making me think, what is going on here? This, it was really messing with my suspension of disbelief dang it <laughs> you know norm it would be easy to say well it's because they had imitated human beings when they came to earth like you know the surfers and all that stuff but they were doing that before they had ever uh, assimilated yeah any human beings so like i said it, it had to have just been a decision that they made but I, yeah i kind of would rather they have stayed alien. And, and maybe that was the purpose is we want the audience to connect with these beings. Right. Despite their alien appearance. Yeah, because they turned out to be the good guys in the end. Maybe that's why they wanted them to feel like they were from Earth, even though they looked like the Green Goblin. So I kind of felt bad that in my estimation, it felt like Nick Fury was the best character in the movie. Yeah. He was the funnest. He was the one that stole the show. <laughs> in Captain Marvel's movie, she wasn't <laughs> the best character in in her own movie. Right, but she's the person with amnesia and the True. and trying to figure out who she is and she's insanely powerful. It's only natural that we would relate to the human character that's looking at her as just like, "Wow, did she just do that?" In the same way as when you and I saw Wonder Woman, we connected a little bit with the Steve Trevor character because he is an everyman. He is just a normal human being walking around with a god or a demigod, whatever you want to say Diana is. It's only natural that you connect with him because that's what you would be in this situation. You're not immortal. You didn't spring fully formed from the side of Zeus. But yeah, the point I was going to make earlier when I m mentioned how good it was to see Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury is they've been talking for years about doing a solo Nick Fury movie. And uh, based on this, oh, I, that can't happen soon enough. <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool. They probably just make it a prequel and, and de-age him again the whole time. Well, yeah, if, if, <laughs> if they can do it as convincingly as they did this, bring it on. Yeah. Because, you know, Sam Jackson's, I think he's almost 70 years old, but you'd never know it in any movie he's appeared in. Right. And so just it would be really, really fun to see him, you know, in the, in the days after this movie, taking charge and moving up the ranks of S.H.I.E.L.D. and saying, you know, I don't like the way that things have been done. Now I'm in charge and we're going to. I guess you do it like as a spy movie or something like that, because it's probably not smart to have it be, a, you know, more alien invasions and stuff like that. <laughs> right. But I don't know. They've been talking for years about doing a, a Black Widow movie, too. And that, again, cannot happen soon enough. And I, yeah, I would hope that there's almost nobody with superpowers in a Black Widow movie. Yeah. Maybe a bad guy that she has to fight has superpowers, but everybody else is just a human being. And it would be a totally different feeling movie in the Marvel Studios films. Yeah, it would be cool. And the last thing, speaking of superpowers, that I wanted to talk about is just uh, Captain Marvel is like Superman, basically. I mean, she, she shoots blasts out of her hands instead of her eyes, but she has super <laughs> strength. She flies. She's basically unstoppable yeah i was bummed out by that at the end of the movie because it was just like oh no she's just too powerful yeah she destroyed a whole spaceship just by flying through it basically she became a dc superhero at the end of the movie exactly where it suddenly she became less interesting and when she shows up in the scene from endgame part of me was just like oh well that's too bad because I wanted to see Yeah, how... it's like, oh, well, that took care of all the problems. Right. Superman arrived. Right. We don't want to see 
you know, an alien versus predator movie where you're just like, oh my gosh, who's going to win? And then the Terminator steps out and says, I will take care of it from here. And he kills the bad guys. You're like, no, I want our characters to deal with this. And I want our characters to be clever enough to figure out how to beat the bad guy. I, surely Marvel Studios is not going to be dumb enough to have Captain Marvel save the day in a movie called Avengers, is it? I hope not. I, I worry for Endgame because of that, what she might be. Because Thanos would not stand a chance against what we saw at the end of Captain Marvel, right? Right. It's like the Justice League and they're fighting this big, terrible thing, but then they bring back Superman and then it's like, oh, okay, well, uh, the day is saved now. <laughs> Who cares about the Justice League? You don't need it when Superman's there. So I don't know. I, I am I am a little apprehensive now about Endgame and exactly how things are going to go. I hope that she doesn't just deus ex machina the thing. Maybe she does something that gets it all, gets the ball rolling, and then the rest of the guys do their thing from there, which that would be fine. I've actually heard someone say a quote from Kevin Feige saying, oh yeah, Captain Marvel is more powerful than any superhero we've seen in the Marvel Universe so far. I heard that too. Captain Marvel can time travel, he said. Oh no, did he say that? I had no idea. It's what I heard he had said. I don't know if this is true. I've heard this second hand. I didn't see like the clip or something. And I'm, I, I guess I could even still go for it if she's like, I can send you back but I can't do it for you or something like that. I could maybe deal with that, but I don't want that to be what happens. We don't want her to solve their problems. It's cool if she facilitates their solving their own problems, but if she just shows up and fixes everything, it becomes the literal deus ex machina where the gods of Olympus would show up to solve the problems of the mortals. Yep. Maybe that's why they call it Endgame, is because it's the end of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> I've no idea how they'll handle it, but I hope, I hope that her part is... Uh, well, I trust them. They've given me no reason not to trust them. True. The fun thing about this movie is that she wasn't that insanely overpowered character until the very, very, very end of the movie. But, you know, I, I worry about whoever has to write Captain Marvel 2 because it's the <laughs> right. Matrix 2 problem of, well, Neo became yep. a god at the end of the Matrix. What are you guys going to do in Matrix 2? And it's like, well, well, we've got some ideas. But the, the, the easy answer is like, well, you have to undo how powerful she is somehow. You have to come up with a kryptonite for Captain Marvel. But I don't know. I mean, the movie did well enough that that's absolutely guaranteed a sequel. So, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time before that gets announced. Yup. We're just waiting to see. I think not until after Endgame will they lay out the schedule for us. But, I mean, we can say, okay, Black Widow movie, basically, they've been saying it's going to happen. You got, I guess, an Ant-Man 3. You got... Black Panther 2, you got uh, Captain Marvel 2, you got Doctor Strange 2. It's five movies there. That's pretty much a whole phase. So I don't know what else we'll have. But Yeah, it, it, there, surely there'll be some surprises. Oh, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 2, I forgot about that one. And 3, three I guess, probably after that. They've been talking about doing The Eternals. Which is just like, wow, I really, okay, uh, I don't know how you're going to pull that off, but I will go to it. And they've been talking about Guardians of the Galaxy 3 on again, off again. Who knows if they'll, uh, if we'll see that or not. Oh, they'll do that. There's no way they're not going to do Guardians 3. Made way too much money with all the others. They're going to do it. How that'll turn out, mm, I don't know. But uh, hopefully it'll be good still. But yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 slightly worried, but I'm I'm like you. I trust Marvel to do a good job. 
they've got a really good track record and I can't complain. So at this point, I'm happy to go see whatever they've got. I don't see a lot of movies anymore. I pretty much only see like the Marvel movies and here and there, maybe a Pixar movie. Even Pixar is kind of, you know, bummed me out to the point that I don't run out and see whatever they have. So I guess like we used to say when we would talk about Pixar, we're in the golden age of Marvel movies and... We talked about that with Pixar, and we were just hoping it would last forever, and at least as long as it possibly could. And uh, hopefully the same thing happens with these Marvel movies. I'm glad to be living through them, and uh, and I can't wait to see what's next, I guess. Well, there you go. And the good thing is, I don't have to. When is uh, Endgame? It's like a month away. Well, by the time I get this sucker edited, it'll be like days away. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. So I'm I'm happy about that. Funny thing is, one thing I was thinking about doing way back when was trying to go back and watch all the movies from Marvel. 1 through 21 before Endgame came out as the big phase 4 finale. See it all. Well, you could have watched those with your wife when your son was like, you sit down, Mom. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're going to sit down with Iron Man first and we're going to watch them all. I would like to do that, but I should have done that before seeing Captain Marvel because that's not going to be out on video before Endgame comes. There's no way to see all of them before Endgame. I guess I could go to the theater. There's that. It'll probably still be in the theater when the other one comes out. Yeah, I'm hoping that there will be theaters that show Infinity War and Endgame as like a double feature because it would be really fun to watch all of that as sort of one story but yeah you never know there there might be a double feature with captain marvel as well back in the days when there were drive-in theaters you'd get that sort of stuff all the time yeah every night was a double feature it was actually a triple because they would show the first movie the second movie and then the first movie again (laughs) usually we used to go to the drive-ins that the there was like one drive-in left in town when i was a in high school and we would go there with lawn chairs because they still had the ones that you would, the speakers that you would like hook on your, your mirror or whatever. Sure. So you could hear instead of a little while later, they started doing it where you just tuned into the radio station. And we, yeah, we would go with lawn chairs and we'd watch the one movie. Then we'd leave our car there because you couldn't pull your car out and go to a different spot because you paid to get into the one spot. But we would just take our lawn chairs and go over to another uh, area and watch the movie there. And then we'd take our lawn chairs and go to the next one after that movie was over. So we'd see like three movies in a night by just uh, moving around with lawn chairs at the drive-in. That's how I saw Free Jack. (laughs) Okay. So it was totally worth it. Free Jack. (laughs) All right. Well, I think we've been going long enough. We're going to let all y'all go to bed. And by all y'all, I mean me. It's really late. (laughs) We started later than usual. So now it's like 2.30 in the morning. See, this was our normal time of uh, quitting way back in the day when we first started the podcast. But I'm so much older now. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed Captain Marvel like we did, and we'll see you again soon for Avengers Endgame. Have a good, like what, is it three days until that happens? Have a good three days, everybody. I've been Big Anklevich. I've been Rich Outfield. Uh, and we're just a girl. <laughs> yes, we are, aren't we? Oh, I'm just a girl. All pretty and petite, so don't let me have any right. Oh, I've had it up to here. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Doesn't have to be, but it is. Oh, am I making myself clear? I'm just a girl in the world.
Ben Mendelsohn. What else has Ben Mendelsohn done? He was the bad guy in Rogue One. You saw that. He was Krennic. He was Krennic, yes. I've seen 20 of his figures the other day. (laughs) And you always shall. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. Not until they finally just take him out to the back and put him in the dumpster. (laughs) (laughs) It's the humane thing. Uh. To do. He was the bad guy in Ready Player One. You saw that. Yeah. Apparently he was in Dark Knight Rises, but I don't remember in what capacity. He might have been like a some kind of uh, bureaucrat kind of guy that says, you can't do this to me. Yeah, policeman. No, Matthew Modine was the, the policeman. Matthew Modine was all of those policemen? Yes, very talented. All guy. the 1,000 of them that they sent down into the sewers? Ironically, no, he was none of those. <laughs> he played a thousand policemen, but none of the ones that went down. None of those ones. <laughs> I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 